I'll have to take faith now. It sounded like a cod line, actually. That's why I just whispered to Paul, I didn't expect that first round. <laughs> um, so uh, um, I want to get back to the contentious part, being that's, uh, that's where I like to go. Um, and I want to play a little bit where, where Jonathan and Louise were about around with, which is so many books from, from this panel come out and get published each year, and so many articles get published each year, and yet every time there's a panel, we come back to the exact same points square one again, which is we get to what is meaning, there is no meaning, there is meaning, there are meaning structures, detecting, constructing. So what I want to know from the panel, and I suspect the room is pretty interested in this as well, is where do we go as a field of science? Because we are scientists, we are can be philosophers as well, we all have our own personal lives, but where do we go next in moving this field forward such that we start to understand meaning? And this is a, uh, there's a little conflict here between a little bit of relativism, which is that we can't impose anything of content on anybody, versus there must be something we can say besides the fact that it's a good thing, uh, it has potentiality for good or evil. Where do we go next? Where would you like to see the field go next as a discipline? Can I just come in there? I think before we can do that, we need to clarify our terms a little bit more carefully because you may notice that we jump from one area to another. We actually end up discussing ethics, we end up discussing human relationships. What is it actually we want to discuss? Do we want to talk about meaning or do we want to talk about purpose? All of those things are very different. So, in my mind, the distinction that needs to be made is, you know, in, in the old days in psychoanalysis, it was all about motivation, which is all about how we are driven through our drives, through our instincts, how we are pushed forward from the past, how we are determined, how we have to be certain things. When we look at meanings, we look more in a horizontal way. We look at how we construct our lives, how we connect to the world. And then we have to be systematic and look at how we connect to the world at all these different levels that I have spoken about yesterday. But there is also the future and a sense of purpose. Where are we going with this? Which is the question you are now throwing on the table. Where are we actually going with this? So what I'm bringing in is the basic human given, which I think we cannot avoid, whichever culture we come from which is that we're all born, and we all have a certain amount of time, and we're all going to die. And during that phase, we evolve. So the meanings for a baby are very different than the meanings for a child, or a teenager, or a young adult. Our meanings evolve, our purposes evolve. And as a human race, our purposes have evolved considerably over many centuries. So what I'd like to know is what is it you want us to debate of all of those different possibilities? <laughs> Everything you said is, 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 is true. And so what I say is this is individually. You have, there's a panel of experts here. Each of you will have your own vantage point for going with this. What I'm interested in is, this will be endless debates. We can spend an hour defining our terms. Each one of you has your own terms. My question is... I, don't, I think we should agree on our terms. And then we can have a meaningful debate, then we can actually take what each of us knows and thread it together, rather like your braiding you were talking about yesterday. It should be a process of weaving. Each of us have a different perspective, a different strand to contribute. As long as we know what it is we're trying to weave together, rather than, you know, go across with everybody throwing a bit on the table and us losing the thread. I have a question, perhaps this will um, help. Um, my question is that, that um, several of you have mentioned this, but I'm surprised that I haven't heard more, and that's that when you're talking about meaning and or purpose, that I haven't heard more about service, service to your fellow man, um, which to me uh, very much is involved in that. and. Um, I would like to know, because several of you have also talked about a chaotic, negative world, and it, it, 
I feel that it, uh, service to fellow man needs to occur in, in a concept of a, of, a, of a positive world because it involves uh, involving yourself in the world. And um, I, would, I would like some comments from the panel about service to others in a positive world. <clears throat> I think, first, it's a great question because I think there's been, even though we haven't talked about it a lot, there's been a common sense that relationships and giving to others is one of the things that's most meaningful for everybody. And I would say our one question that we've tried to ask in, uh, in our intellectual tradition has been, why is that satisfying? What makes doing for others satisfying? And we've been doing experiments on this. I'll discuss some of them coming up. But one of the things we find is when you really give to another person, there's a number of satisfactions in it. One is that if you effectively help somebody else, you feel effective and competent, you have efficacy in that, so that's a well-known human satisfaction. But another thing is you feel connected to that person. So you feel relationship, and you feel uh, that sense of, uh, of, uh, of belonging and connection that comes from that. And the third thing is if you're helping somebody willingly, then you also feel that sense of autonomy and agency that I think is really satisfying and organizing an experience. And what we've shown is that helping other people gives you, satisfies all three of those very basic psychological needs. Now we also make people help other people or cajole them into helping other people as a contrasting condition. And what you find there is even though they help, none of those psychological satisfactions come about. It's because we willingly and from our heart care about others, that we find a deep satisfaction in it. And then I think that's why it contributes to you, Dr. Dean. I'd like to, well, I'd like to reinforce that uh, point. Uh, one of the uh, research uh, themes that I had uh, that I picked up was uh, to help people who, uh, in schools who were doing service learning programs, and to be able to have them dem be able to demonstrate value of service learning uh, for their uh, school administrators and people who do the, the funding for the, uh, the schools. And so that became a, a, a very big thing that there was going to be research on service learning. But what the state of Maryland did was to mandate that there has to be a certain number of hours that every student is going to well, have to do in providing service to the community. The only unfortunate thing about that was, as soon as it was made a requirement, it became a checklist. Another thing I have to do, and all of the benefits drain away from service learning once it becomes mandated. I would like to thank you. I would like to from something you do voluntarily to make it into duty, which is an entirely different level of program. I'd like to ask the panelists from they may think about the Jungian concept of synchronicity and how that may relate to personal meaning. And I guess my question would be is if science, because it seems to be related to uh, quantum mechanics, and if science somehow is able to get a framework where there's some kind of connections that may work may causally, which are not the normal kinds of connections, what, what kind of effect do you think that would have on people to know that maybe there's a possibility even that the framework could? People, and again, what, what do you think the effect would have on people's consciousness if, if there was a framework for people to, to uh, know that that may be something that's a scientific ability? I'll take that question. And uh, I'm noticing that there's a lot of emphasis on the human world in this discussion, not just on the person as an individual but the person is connected to other human beings. But I also think it's very important to add a larger perspective, and I'll call that a transpersonal perspective that goes beyond the human world to include uh, aspects of the world such as the environment and other species. And also to look at our existence, uh, not just individually, but collectively over time and to view the issue of meaning and purpose in life uh, in terms of a cosmic perspective. What might be meaningful in a scheme of a hundred years may wane in meaning over a thousand years and may be very meaningless in the sense of uh, a point in time where our sun ceases to exist 
and our planet is uh, uh, long since forgotten in terms of human understanding. So with that said, uh, in terms of synchronicity, uh, I'll comment briefly that uh, uh, synchronicity is a construct that uh, consists of a coincidence on which uh, meaning is attributed. And the question becomes, uh, when things are very spooky, uh, unusual occurrences uh, happen together, is that uh, merely chance, randomness, or is that something that reflects some pattern of meaning, perhaps as Jung uh, speculated, a causally? Uh, so I think that, that kind of gets to the heart of the issue of my perspective on meaning, which is whether we impose meaning, whether we discover meaning, uh, or whether we can live in the ambiguity of not knowing whether there's meaning or not. I'm not, I'm not going to directly address that question. But I've been sitting here thinking about one of the core issues that we've been discussing. So I, I just want to say something briefly about that. And it's this relativistic, absolute dichotomy. You know, are there actual meanings? Well, here's a way of thinking about it. Human beings play games. Kids play games everywhere. But not just kids, by the way. Animals play games. To rats play with each other. And rats actually have rules. Like, when two rats are wrestling, this is pretty cool. If two rats wrestle repeatedly, the bigger rat can always win. But unless the big rat lets the little rat win 30% of the time, the little rat won't invite the big rat to play anymore. Now, this is really important. Jeff makes up the story this, by the way. And this is really, really, really important. Because it shows that even rats, and they're sort of like the archetypal evil animal. Rats. rats have a sense of fair play. Now, when you're talking about universal, you've got to ask yourself what you mean. Do you mean metaphysically universal? Do you mean biologically universal? But let's go with biologically universal, since, you know, we're pretty empirical. Well, are there biological universals? Well, there's a bunch of them. One of them is that creatures play, especially mammals. So humans play, and they play complex games. So what games they play, man, there's variation in that. The fact that the games have a rule-like structure and all the players know when someone is cheating and when someone isn't, that's also universal. Okay, so a game is like a belief system. In fact, it's very much like a belief system. Kids like to play games because games are like what adults do, except for the microcosm. So kids learn how to be adults by playing games. And we're playing a game and everybody knows the rules and that's why you want to step up and speaking randomly. Okay, now, so one truth is that there are games. And then another truth is that the people who are playing the games know when someone is following the rules and when someone isn't. Okay, but here's another truth, and you all know this, and this is an important one, and it bears on a more abstract form of absolutism. Your son comes home and he's lost his hobby. He's all irritated about him. He slams his stick down on the, on the floor and so on. So you say, doesn't matter. Whether you win or lose, it matters how you win the game. And your son thinks, what kind of horribly stupid thing is that to say? You're supposed to win the hockey game, everybody's out there winning, make sure if you win, you should be the star. What do you mean? It only matters how you play the game. Well, you might ask yourself, what in fact do you mean? Well, you certainly mean it, but you don't know what you mean. But it can be formalized pretty easily. People not only play games, they play iterated games. Every time you talk to someone during a game, then you go to another person and you talk to them, and that's a different game, and then you're off doing something else, and that's a different game. But you're always in the game, and you're playing the games throughout your life. So here's, here's a truth. Play each game in such a way that the probability that people will invite you to play more games increases. Now that's really, that's a form, you could say, that's a form of meta-morality, and it is in fact a form of meta -morality. It's also emergent, and it's also absolute. In fact, even though that's, that emerges out of the social convention, you're actually adapted to do it. And so not only are there universal truths like there are games and games have rules and people know how to follow them, there's universal truths above that, which is we also know how to play iterative games in a way that we're more likely to be invited to play them, and we also think of that as even more important in terms of right and wrong. And so we know some things about that. 
capsulized versus relativism. And in some ways, we're beyond that discussion. There are structures of morality, and structures of morality that have rules at different levels of analysis, and there's reasons for that. Can, can we go back to his question a little bit more? Because you weren't talking about human rules, were you? You weren't looking for something at a broader level, like a sort of cosmic. Uh, okay. So I will allow it's some pity, of it's an interesting question. And then I will invite our king, she has done more research on me than anybody else. <laughs> and, uh, this uh, is a lovely king or queen. And I'll ask her to make a comment, a quick comment, and uh, one more word. Uh, I'm a little bit in the point that uh, we're not able to comment on the question. So people don't read a paper or book, they all start to tell them. And since the beginning, I hope that uh, the people start with you know, my book and the question. My idea is that I will come to present that, okay? But it's hard to integrate. <coughs> relationship, achievement, self-transcendent, religion, they're all part of the meaning, it's not that it's the meaning of it.